So welcome everybody to the next in the series of Encore Live presentations. I'm your host, James Smith, Regional Director of Encore Tours out here in sunny, albeit a little smoky, Northern California. It looks like we have participants joining us from all around the country. So on behalf of all of us at Encore Tours, we'd like to thank you so much for being with us here today. Before we get started, we just need to run over the format of the webinar, how it works, just so you're all aware. All attendees are muted uh, currently and throughout the presentation. Um, however, we do want this to be somewhat interactive. So please feel free to use the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen that you should find at the bottom of your screen to make any comments or ask any questions during the presentation. And then at the end, we'll hopefully get to those and be able to answer those for you. Additionally, this webinar is going to be is currently being recorded and it's going to be available to watch on our blog tomorrow. So this week, we're going to hear part one of Mac the Knife and the wild years of Berlin. Our first half will take us to 1920s Berlin, German capital, to set the scene following World War I and how the, one of the most famous and popular tunes of the 20th century was created by composer Kurt Weill. It's going to be a two-part webinar with the next uh, part being next week. In part two, very briefly, we're going to dive deeper then into the composition, the music itself, and uh, the popularity of Mac the Knife, the piece of music, how it took off globally, worldwide. And to lead us on this journey is uh, our great Marcus Stuckelberger, longtime Encore Tour manager. He's been with us about 30 years. He's joining us all the way from France, and he should hopefully be there. Hello, Marcus. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Great. And we good. have a lovely, we have a lovely um, sunny day here. I've just come back from grape picking, so I'm in good, good shape. Fantastic. So you'll be crushing the grapes later. Send us a bottle of wine, Marcus. So as well as being a leading, well, as well as leading our musicians around Europe, you obviously have a strong passion in the arts and jazz performance, Marcus. But what interested you to study deeper into this particular piece of music? Well, Probably because I'm a trumpet player and uh, I started playing the trumpet when I was eight years old. And I suppose this was the song that influenced me to start playing the trumpet. Fantastic. Excellent. I, I also understand, I think Mac was, am I right in thinking Mac was one of your nicknames at high school? It was uh, the, the nickname. It was Mackie. We were Mackie. four Marcuses in the same uh, school class. And so, yeah, that was my nickname. All right. Okay. Perfect. How appropriate. So without further ado, Mac the tour manager or Marcus the knife, whichever you want to take up, take us away into the world of 1920s Berlin. Great, thank you. Well, we started our show now. Here we are in uh, Berlin and I want to talk about this uh, wonderful piece of music, which in German is actually called Die Moritat von Mecki Messer. And Die Moritat von Mecki Messer uh, is translated simply as Mac the Knife, but we have to remember this is a um, song that is part of a um, play, and the play in German is called Die Drei Groschen Oper. Uh, we're going to have a listen to the Drei Groschen Oper, uh, and uh, for people who haven't heard the song for a long time, this is the original version of Mac the Knife. Der Haifisch, der hat Zähne und die trägt er im Gesicht. Und McKeith, der hat ein Messer, doch das Messer sieht man nicht. So that was a recording I did three days ago, so it's just a rehearsal. Uh, um, what I would like to do now is actually tell you a little bit about the setting of this song and especially where this song all started. And as I mentioned, it started in Berlin. So let's have a look, uh, first of all, at, at what I'm going to talk about during the next half an hour. So Berlin in the interwar years, that means between 1918 and 1939. Then Kurtweil and Bertolt Brecht, those were the creators of the Threepenny Opera. Kurtweil was the composer and Bertolt Brecht uh, was the writer. Then um, 
the threepenny opera adventure that means the story about the um putting on stage of of the threepenny opera so this is what i'm going to do today and then in a week i'm going to talk about uh, another war and basically the story about threepenny opera after the first night and as well uh, the destiny of the actors and actresses part of the first show the second uh, chapter would be then the composition and an analysis of the comp composition and the third would be mac comes to america that means uh, the version that you probably are familiar with so let's start with Berlin 1920s. Here is the Potsdamer Platz, which is the main, well, one of the main squares of Berlin. And on this screen, you can see uh, trams, you can see horse uh, carried bus, um, horse pulled buses. You can actually see some cars. You can see carts, people walking, bicycles. And the thing that I was very fascinated, I'm still very fascinated, of the 1920s is that there was a real uh, transition period where you had uh, cars, uh, horses, uh, well, where you really moved uh, very, very, very fast into the 20th century with all the industrial inventions that came later on. So to understand Mac the Knife, you do have to understand the history of uh, Germany. To understand the history of Germany, here we are. Uh, we should look at the map of 1920s. So this is a map that shows you the, the new Europe after the end of the First World War. What you can see here in green is Germany. Germany has changed shape. It lost quite a lot of bits here in the east and as well of here in the West, for example, Alsace-Lorraine. Now, uh, Germany uh, was an empire. Uh, the Emperor Wilhelm uh, II lost the Second World War, and it was decided that Germany would become a republic. The republic was called the Weimar Republic. Now we can see, uh, again, a map of Germany, and the city of Weimar is here, because you might wonder, why it's called the Weimar Republic. The simple reason is that the Weimar Republic, um, well, the, the Republic was called the Weimar Republic because the first constitution was signed there. The first assembly was um, held in the city of Weimar and the city of Weimar was chosen because Weimar for the Germans is the heart of the literary world of Germany, of the cultural world of Germany, simply because the German hero, culturally, is Goethe. And Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was born there, was uh, a citizen of Weimar. And uh, his counterpart in terms of um, playwright, Friedrich Schiller, uh, died in Weimar. So it was in a way uh, a, a very conscious choice to use Weimar as a symbolic uh, uh, town where the first constitution was signed, but it's a tiny place. So uh, capital has to be chosen. And of course, this was Berlin. Berlin literally exploded in the last 50 years. It uh, increased three times in size and it became the third biggest city in the world after New York and London. Now you have to imagine, this is a place, Berlin, where uh, you've got so many different people coming into it because there is opportunity for labor. So you've got a huge working class. The, as, as I mentioned, industry is going, uh, is going very strong and uh, there are lots of new factories opening with, of course, um, factory owners with a huge bourgeoisie that um, uh, wanted to have fun. Now, they want to have fun because they didn't have fun up till now. Imagine, this is a town where until 1918, there were lots of people, lots of men who were fighting the war in the East and the West. And uh, after 1918, Germany had lost 1.7 million inhabitants. Terrible. So uh, they lost the war. That meant they had to repay back uh, to to the, the, the winning 
alliance. And not only that, they um, basically uh, lost territory. So everything changed. You wanted to forget that period. You wanted to forget that period and you thought, well, what's looming in the future? Well, doesn't look very rosy. There will be inflation. There will be all sorts of tensions and you want not to think about uh, the, the, this, the future either. So what do you do? You think about the present. The present means enjoy life. How do you enjoy life? It's the nightlife. That's what you want to, to do, is being in, uh, in, in a place where things are happening. And uh, Berlin realized that this would be the great moment to start entertaining people because people wanted to entertain. Imagine, in a few years, there were 300 new cinemas. There were nearly the same amount of cabarets, nearly the same amount of theaters, of nightclubs. People wanted to go out, have fun. At the same time, the theaters, the cabarets needed to attract the people. They needed to be sure that people would go to their theater to see their shows. Now, this is a picture of downtown Berlin with the taxi just arriving, somebody getting off. But what I really want to look at is this picture here. This is a painting painted at the period, 1920s. And you can see very sophisticated ladies here. Look at their hats, look at what they wear. Looks like a red fur coat. Look at the, these gentlemen, uh, their cigarette. And in the background, you see this man who is obviously a, a, a co somebody who has arrived with a coach, he's a taxi driver or something like this. And what you can see is the color, the vibrancy of the period. So this is a period things need to be fun. Now, fun, this is fun. You go to a big palace, you see a floor show, and you look at the Can Can girls going, hey, yeah, there you are. This is what people wanted to see. But what happened as well is that people realized life, even nightlife could be boring. So let's push limits further. Let's have more fun by just going completely wild. And this is why, personally, I think we shouldn't call this period the golden years of Berlin, because that's how normally it's referred to, but the wild years of Berlin. I think this painting by Georges Gross shows you very much this period. Again, lots of energy, lots of movement. Look at this man. He's in trance, probably fueled by alcohol. Uh, he's probably a bourgeois, uh, quite a rich person. He's got a, a watch chain here. And look at the background. You can see the skulls. What has been left over from the previous period, from the First World War? Here you see the backside of a lady. Here you see what looks like a porter or, or a taxi driver. All this is part of this nightlife. So it is a moment, is it period of decadence and what I think is amazing is to think let's have a look what Berlin and what people in Berlin thought about three or four years beforehand this is what it was so I'm going to show you a few postcards just to give you uh, an idea of what life was before the 20s and what life was during the 20s. So here we've got the postcard. It says here, faithful love. And underneath it, it, it says, even though we are separated, my dear, we will stay always faithful to each other. This is what it looks afterwards. Now, this is the imagery of the 1920s. No sentimentality, provocation. These are two ladies dancing together. Imagine, for example, that this soldier died during the First World War somewhere in the trenches in uh, Flanders. Well, perhaps she ended up like this, we don't know. But the difference in a very short, short period is absolutely incredible. Then here, we've got another picture. It says, God protects our father. And underneath, you've got 
the family that is praying. Now, this is what it looks like for the man who comes back. He's seen his friends being massacred in the trenches. He wants to forget things and he sombers in alcoholism. Here another picture. You have the soldier looking at the uh, looking at, at his love and his love is so coy she doesn't even look at him and there you've got this picture the lady with provocation looks again at you look how she's dressed the pearls look at him he's got opera glasses what is he looking at probably the people on stage the girls the legs of the can can girls so there we have a nice comparison of the two periods now this is the reality though the reality is beggars war veterans coming back and what is very tough is that these war veterans they need to beg to uh survive and you've got these people uh in 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 the city everywhere and not only that crime is starting uh, there's a whole underworld that starts an underworld that inspired Max the Knife, that inspired this song that I'm going to talk about. Now, if I ask you, the, what image have you got if you think about the 1920s, 30s, Berlin, Cabaret, what do you think about? Well, I'm pretty sure, just you looking at uh, the two first words, Berlin Cabaret, this comes to mind. Yes, the film Cabaret, a film of the 1970s with Liza Minnelli as the star. And I think many people have been very, very influenced by the imagery of that, that film. It's a very strong film. And we can imagine how the cabaret atmosphere was because in this film, it's very clear. There we see a rel relatively small cabaret, but you probably want to know whether if you go now to Berlin, you would find those cabarets. Could you retrace these places from the 1920s, 1930s? Well, the answer is this, no, because Berlin was destroyed in the next war. This is World War II, the next war, and Berlin looked like this. So you will be very lucky to find traces of these nightclubs, of these theatres, because of uh, what happened in 1945. Again, if you're in Berlin, if you're going to Berlin, you might want to uh, see where the areas were. Even though you can't visit these nightclubs, you want to know where it all happened. Well, here is one area of uh, Berlin, which is the Friedrichstraße, which was basically the main area of the cabaret. There was the Black Cat Cabaret on, on the other side of the road was the white mice cabaret they were the most famous one of these small cabarets uh imagine this is now well this used to be in east berlin the wall more or less went right through the middle here then uh we had another area here the alexander platz with with the very famous palace called the Rezi. then we had here the Kurfürstendamm, which then became the main amusement center during uh, the, the division when this was part of West Berlin. Here you had mainly the cinemas, but as well nightclubs, lesbian clubs, homosexual clubs. Then here, Charlottenburg was the more bourgeois area. You had the Scala, for example, the Scala was the picture I show, showed you at the beginning with the Can Can girls. You had as well here, Potsdamer Platz, and there's a one place that I want to talk to you at Potsdamer Platz, which is called the Haus Vaterland, a very interesting place. It was a restaurant, which is called a themed restaurant, on five floors, where on one floor you, had, for example, had the Rhine, you had Lorelei, the, the Lorelei Rock, and there was literally water flowing through the restaurant. There was a cabaret uh, area as well, and there was a cinema in the back. So that was a real entertainment palace, huge. Well, what happened to it? 
Here it is in 1970. You can see the Berlin Wall just built on front of it. We are watching it from Berlin West. We're watching over the wall towards East Berlin. Now, this is the round tower you can hear, see here. Here on top would be the um, cupola. And uh, nothing happened here because uh, it was too close to the wall. It stayed uh, ruined for a very long time. I have here a comparison, 1912, 1947. After the first, Second World War, you can see how the cupola was damaged here. And this is 2019. This all has gone. So unfortunately, when you go to Berlin, <laughs> this is what you're going to see instead. So. I've talked enough about this. Let's go back to Mac the Knife. And let's go back to the first night of the Threepenny Opera, 1928. The story of the first night of the Threepenny Opera is so fascinating, I could talk a whole evening about it. Uh, let's just uh, do uh, it in short steps. The Threepenny Opera was premiered in the Theater am Schiffbauerdamm, which is here along the River Spree. Here you've got the River Spree. Here you've got the Friedrichstraße, which I mentioned was uh, the main amusement area. And the theater looked like this, Theater am Schiffbauerdamm. Uh, in 1928, it was bought by a young chap called Ernst Johann Aufricht. And Herr Aufricht had quite a bit of family money, a lot of ideas. He was young. He restored the theater, and he thought, he thought, well, I'm there to um, to open this theater to new ideas. I need the audience, so I need uh, somebody who can uh, come up trumps with new ideas. And he knew who he had in mind. Who he had in mind was this guy, Bertolt Brecht. And Bertolt Brecht, uh, when he heard that Mr. Aufricht was interested in his, his, his writings, he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a theater play, which is not a play. I'm going to do an opera, which is, not, which is not an opera. I'm going to do a cabaret that is not a cabaret, but I'm going to mix it. And I'm going to do a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, show that will uh, attract the working classes, the intellectuals, and the bourgeoisie. And I'm going to, for example, have the orchestra, not in the pit, the orchestra is going to be on stage. Then I'm going to have actors and actresses singing. I don't want to have opera singers for this opera. I want to have actors and actresses because I want to have a dramatic effect. I want to be sure that people will understand what they're saying, not sing some um, Italian aria, nobody will understand the words, no. The words are important. So he tells that to Mr. Aufricht, and Mr. Aufricht said, great idea. I'm going to go to the banker, see whether I can get some money. So he goes to the banker, and the banker says, oh, Mr. Aufricht, nice to see you. What do you want to do? So Aufricht explains about his project, and, her Aufricht, uh, and, and the banker says to her, Aufricht, okay, follow me. He opens the door, gets out of the office, goes across the corridor, opens another door, and this is what he shows to Mr. Alfred. This is where your money is going to go. If you go with Mr. Brecht, forget it. Well, the banker was wrong because <laughs> the Drei Groschen Opera, Threepenny Opera, became the hit of Berlin of the 1930s, 1920s, well, 28 to 1930. So here is the story, the beginning of the story, because in the second part, you will hear everything about the rehearsals and the first night at the Schiff Power Dam. Now it's time, though, to talk about the composer of Mac the Knife, and here we are, Kurt Weil. Now, Kurt Weil was born in a provincial German town. His uncle was a rabbi, and his father was a cantor of, a local, of the local synagogue. As a child, he was completely absorbed in music. He played the piano very well as a young child. And his big, big um, dream was to study with one of the master, masters of German contemporary classical music. The only place to go to was Berlin. So he went to Berlin and he studied 
he wanted first to t study with Schoenberg, but then he realized he was more attracted to uh, Mr. Busoni, who taught him composition. So he studied with him. And uh, Busoni's um, theory was to uh, always build on what was already there and not to destroy, like Schoenberg, he wanted to destroy music to rebuild something new and Busoni wanted to use what there was already. And this is very important because Kurtweil always linked up his music to what was there before. So his first compositions in Berlin were very much influenced by the compositions of Mahler, of Stravinsky, of Hindemith, who was his contemporary, until he met Bertolt Brecht. When he met Bertolt Brecht, he met as well a lady. A lady, I'm going to talk to you later on about her, and the style of his music changed completely. With the rise of Hitler, very early on in 34-35, he realized he had to escape Berlin because of being Jewish, and he fled to Paris. In Paris, he got very much influenced by the Latin rhythms, which were very much uh, fashionable at the Bal Musettes uh, the, in, in the Paris places where they played the uh, accordion. And there he played, uh, he, he composed, for example, Yucali, which is uh, played now very often. You probably know it. Uh, it's, it's a habanera. It goes. And so on. So you really got more into popular music and, as I say, into Latin rhythm. That follows on because after Paris, the next place was New York. So he uh, arrives in New York, and from the moment he arrives in New York, New York he says, I'm not German anymore. I'm an American. Give me an American passport. And he got one very soon. And he, in fact, uh, refused to speak German. He only spoke English. So he uh, started to write American music for the entertainment business. business. And his musicals were a big success. So, for example, The Lady in the Dark or um, A Touch of Venus uh, were a big hit on Broadway. So, um, uh, basically, we can say Kurtweil lost his German roots. He died in 1950 and he left us a huge amount of work. Perhaps the most striking aspect uh, of Kurtweil's composition is that he never rejected any style. And here is a quote that I would like you to read. My concern is to find the purest expression in music for what I want to say, without enough trust in my instinct, my taste, and my talent to write always good music, regardless of the style I'm writing in. Well, for Weil, there was only good or bad music. He wrote string quartets, symphonies, choral works, operas, theater songs, well, musicals, film music. For him, style was immaterial, something which many music critics found very hard to handle. Then another saying, as for myself, I write for today. I don't give a damn about writing for posterity. Well, in a way, he was right, because who knows Courtois? People don't, don't talk about Courtois because they just know the tunes. But if you actually look at the tunes and you look at songs like Speak Low, Speak Low, da, 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 one of the jazz standards, how many recordings there exist of Speak Low or September song? It's amazing how even now I'm talking, I'm sure somebody is recording one of his songs. So we can't really say that uh, posterity has forgotten him. No, he's still with us. So let's uh, do another step because he falls in love with this lady. Uh, and uh, uh, what I think is, is very interesting is that he said at one point, uh, Either my life is influenced by Schoenberg or by the love of my life. 
Well, it was the love of his life, who was Lotte Lenya. Well, Lotte Lenya, in contrast to Courtois, was very outgoing. She was uh, a, a girl that constantly talked and chatted and uh, had fun time. Her dream was the circus. And in fact, she ended up doing cabaret in Paris, uh, sorry, in, in Berlin. And uh, she was more or less successful, but she didn't have a brilliant singing voice. But as soon as Kurt Weil fell in love with Lotte Lenya, Kurt Weil said, I'm going to write songs for Lotte Lenya. I'm going to write songs for an actress, not songs for a singer. So that's where Brecht and Kurt Weil and Lotte Lenya got together to produce something brilliant. And one of Weil's invention uh, was the Sprechstimme, which means that you use the voice of the singer not as a singing voice, but, but as a speaking voice. So there are lots of songs like Surabaya Johnny, where basically Lotte Lenya is not singing, she's talking. Uh, and that, at that time, in the 40s, that was new, that uh, didn't exist really beforehand. So Lotte Lenya left for Berlin, sorry, left for America as well, uh, in the 1930s. Although she and, and Kurt Weil had a rocky relationship, they divorced, but then remarried. Um, and after Weil's death, uh, Lotte Lenya continued uh, the song, to sing the songs of Kurt Weil, and uh, she continued even performing the Therpeny Opera and was present when Louis Armstrong did his version of Max the Knife in 1955. So there we are. We probably uh, would need a break after that, but we don't have it because I want to go back to the Theater am Schiffbauerdamm. And here we are. We are now com coming to the, first, uh, to the first rehearsals. Well, what is interesting about this is uh, that the, 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 the rehearsals right from the start didn't go where, that well at all. Four days before the first night, oh, first problem. What was the problem? Courtois decided he would cast a star as the villain Machina, Max the Knife. He would use Harald Paulsen. Harald Paulsen was very famous uh, because he was known from films already. He was on, on, on stage and he was uh, known as being the heartthrob of Berlin, blue eyes, blonde hair. Well, of course, Herr Aufrecht was very pleased. This will be the big success because we have a star. The only problem, Harald Paulsen said, so my role, yeah, I read this uh, script. So you want, to you want me to play, uh, you want me to play a villain? Well, yes, I'm prepared to play a villain, but a criminal looks like this, like this with a, you know, I can't because my audience loves me how I am. I want to look like this. You know, I want to appear in my uh, blue silk scarf because that's what I always do. Oh, the ladies, the ladies, they love it. So what he decides is just to walk out, say, goodbye. I'm not playing a criminal. I'm not playing uh, Max the Knife. I'm not playing a murderer. <gasps> Kurt Weil and Bertolt Brecht got together and said, we cannot afford to lose Harald Paulsen. Please make sure we can keep him. So they have the genius idea. And this is the clue. They have an idea to say, look, we're going to uh, compose a song. Not for him. We're going to do something that is known in popular culture in, in, in Germany. We're going to create a moritat. And a moritat is based on the fact that somebody is going to tell you about murders, about crimes, about all sorts of terrible things, disasters, catastrophes that happened before the show starts. While well, a moritat was people who were in uh, squares of medieval cities who told you what was going to happen. But you didn't see the villain because they were basically like a newspaper or a storyteller or an illustrator. So it was uh, decided that 
instead of Harald uh, disguising himself as a villain, villain, you would have somebody who would sing about this charmer. And he would say, have a look at this guy. This guy is a murderer. He is like a shark, but a shark who doesn't show his teeth. He's a shark that has a knife, but the knife you won't see. So Kurt Weil and Bertolt Brecht write the Moritat von Mekki Messe, the song Mac the Knife, overnight to avoid that this guy, Harald Paulsen, will walk out of the show. And I just want to show you, to finish this first section of the talk, I just want to li listen with you again at the original version of uh, Kurt Weil's Mac the Knife. Der Haifisch, der hat Zähne und die trägt er im Gesicht. Und McKeith, der hat ein Messer, doch das Messer sieht man nicht. Well, here we are. This is the end of the first part. So if you want to know what happened in the rehearsals afterwards, and this is disaster until the first night on the Schiff Bauer Dam, uh, come and join me next week. Uh, so next week at the same time, I'm going to talk to you uh, about following things. I'm going to talk to you about what happened to the performers of uh, the Trepani Opera during the war. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, emigration of, uh, of the musicians. I'm going to talk to you about uh, what happened when the Threepenny Opera came to New York. And of course, I'm going to talk to you about Louis Armstrong and the versions that uh, you probably are very familiar with. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you next, thirst uh, next Thursday. Yes, thank you. Excellent, Marcus. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful and painted such a, a great picture of uh, Berlin after World War One and, and World War Two. That was excellent. We actually do have a couple of questions. I see that we've come have come in into the um, question and answer box. Um, one person would like to know that when Kurt Weil arrived in New York, what was his reaction in relation to the persecution of the Jews? Um, what, you know, once he arrived. Well, what I think is very interesting that he, of course, was aware of the Holocaust. He was aware, actually, of concentration camps. One of his uh, first things that he's actually managed to do is do a performance at Carnegie Hall with people who actually were in concentration camps. There was a mixture of music and interviews of people who would tell you how Germany was like under Hitler and uh, during the war. And uh, one most striking element was that uh, when uh, Kurt Weil involved himself in the um, war effort, in the American war effort, he composed together with Bertolt Brecht songs in German that were demoralizing songs that were played on German radio wow. so that the German soldiers would hear a song, they would realize actually they're going to lose the war. There was this uh, amazing song called the, um, the, the song of 
the, the Ballad of the Soldier's Wife, which is, uh, tells you how the soldier's wife gets lovely present from uh, her husband, a uh, soldier from Paris, when they occupy Paris. You know, she, she gets wonderful shoes, beautiful shoes. She gets wonderful scarf, silk mm -hmm. scarf from Amsterdam. And then it continues like this. And uh, all the neighbors are, of course, jealous. Oh, she gets lovely things. And the last parcel that she gets comes from Russia. And it's a, 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 a widow's veil. Oh, wow. And that's it. So quite, right. quite tough stuff, yeah. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Do we know much about Kurt Vile's musical training, um, you know, from his earlier years? I know you mentioned, I think, Sch uh, Schoenberg. Um, was he writing his other musical genres, his choral pieces, and that before the Three Penny Opera came along, or was that mostly after... Uh, no, it was it was his classical period was before before the Threepenny Opera really. Uh, his his pieces were always rather well are quite complicated, and they often are based on uh, strange intervals. And I'm going to talk to you about that uh, next week because I'm going to analyze the intervals of of Max and I go into depth of that. Oh, fantastic! So lots to lots to hear next week. Um, someone did ask a, a good, a fun question, actually. That we might, again, we might get into it next week. Because of Mac the Knife's kind of unsavory subject matter, if you like, was it ever banned in any countries? Well, yes, in England, actually. Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yes, the BBC, the BBC banned it. Um, I, th I think one fear was that, um, actually, the, the, the knife part of it and in fact uh, when Bobby Darin did a concert in I think 1959 there was a ride for young people thinking they were just going having fun frightening people with a knife and running around with a knife pretending they're attacking people because they want to copy <laughs> that thing so I, I that was that was but was not really the unsavory part of it I think it was more that they were worried about the fact that it was uh, you know the hero was the villain and of course, right. that's all part of um, Kurt Weil and Bertolt Brecht's idea of turning things around. And you, everything is ironical. Everything is the other way around. So that the hero is the villain means really the world is not going well. But of course, you need to know the show to understand that. Right, right. Uh, this song must have influenced so many artists and uh, in, in their writing. Do we know, you know, the, the, how much it did influence that? Well, yeah, I think, but to be honest, the, the song itself is so simple that uh, right. it's a bit difficult. It's like saying, you know, uh, Three Blind Mice has influenced many people. Uh, I, I think it has influenced people by the fact that the, um, in my opinion, because I'm a jazz musician, that you have to give people space. That means if you have a song that goes dun, 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 and nothing else for a bit, <laughs> It means that the instruments or the vocalists have space to unfold themselves, to be creative, to improvise. And I think that's probably one of the most important um, things. When you look at jazz classics, you have to give the um, instrumentalists time to, to elaborate their, mm. their, their improvisations. Right. It's obviously so interesting when you actually read the, all the lyrics to the song. I mean, we've been, all of us have been humming it for years, and it's so upbeat and la 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 la. And then you read it, the words are, <laughs> it's just uh, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Do you know in Berlin now, are there shows, is this still performed? In uh, yes, of course. Yeah, what is interesting is the, that the Thre Threepenny Opera is still the most performed show in Germany. That oh. means that with all the shows together, even in well, 2019, unfortunately, we had COVID in 2020. I don't know. But in 2019, it was still the most performed German speaking show in Germany. Right. So it is, it, that is, and to be honest, I said that all theatres were demolished. Well, not the Theater am Schiffbauer Dam. That is still exists. You, you can still go there. Well, it was um, bombed, but it was reconstructed and restored. And it was the home of the Berlin Ensemble for, you know, long years. And it still uh, shows, uh, plays. Oh, brilliant. We'll have to include that in some of our itineraries, I think, especially yeah. for our, our musical directors and musical groups. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Marcus, uh, for presenting part one uh, for us today. That's all we have time for. The webinar, as I mentioned earlier, is being has been recorded and will be available to watch on our blog tomorrow. 
Part two will follow next week, same day, same time, Thursday, September 10 at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As Marcus mentioned, we'll delve deeper into the musical score itself and follow the path of the music's global popularity. You'll find the webinar link down in the chat box below at the bottom of your screen, and we'll send out reminders again next week. We hope to see you all there again until next Thursday. Thank you all for joining us. Auf Wiedersehen and Boston. Thank you. Boston, play us out.